there is an enormous number of stars in the universe. However, only a very small percentage of them, but yet many hundreds, are visible on a clear night with the naked eye. To measure the brightness of a celestial object as seen from the Earth, it is customary to use the so-called apparent magnitude. The apparent magnitude m is a number which is such that the brighter an object appears, the lower m will be. Clearly, the Sun has the lowest possible magnitude, about minus 27. After the Sun, there are the Moon and Venus. The brightest star, Sirius, has a magnitude of minus 1.46. The most brilliant stars, first magnitude stars, include Canopus and Rigil in the southern skies, and Arcturus, Vega and Capella in the northern ones. Since we are interested only in naked eye observations, it is important to establish the human limit. For a very experienced astronomer, in very favorable conditions, the maximal magnitude is equal to 6. But for normal people, including myself, is around 5. In any case, in a clear sky there are typically hundreds of stars below magnitude 6. It follows that the sky of our ancestor, when there was no pollution, and especially no light pollution, was plenty of brilliant stars. Today we count the stars in this way. Each star is identified by a progressive Greek letter, plus the name of the corresponding constellation. A great deal of stars, however, also have their own individual names, many of which derive from old traditions. For instance, the most brilliant star of the constellation Lyra, Alpha Lyrae, is Vega. To understand the motion of the stars, we have to realize that stars move in relation to each other and also to us, but that we cannot appreciate such proper movements since they are too slow. So, the movement of the stars as seen from the Earth is only apparent due to the rotation of the Earth itself. Stars just circle around the celestial pole. All stars which are sufficiently near the pole are never seen to go beyond the horizon in their rotation. These stars are termed circumpolar and are visible the whole night, every night. Egyptians call them imperishable, the stars which never die. The stars which are sufficiently near the opposite pole, of course, never rise. In other words, the visible portion of the heavenly vault depends on the position of the observer. All the non-circumpolar stars rise and set. However, on certain days a certain star can be over the horizon only during the hours of sunlight, thus effectively being invisible due to the presence of the sun. Stars consequently have an invisibility period. This period ends with the so-called heliacal rising. On this day, the star is visible for a few moments, low on the eastern horizon, while the sun is still under the horizon. There was a great deal of attention to this phenomenon in antiquity. For instance, the Greek poet Hesiod, in the 8th century BC, wrote, When the Pleiades, daughters of Atlas, are rising, then begin the harvest. While watching the diurnal sky, it is natural to identify forms and images in the shapes of the clouds. Similarly, during the night, images can be identified by joining the bright dots of the stars. In this way, a series of still eyes of figures, the constellations, are formed. Our constellations came down to us from the Greeks and the Romans, but originated in the Near East. In this boundary stone of the 12th century BC, for instance, we see the constellation Draco, Leo and Scorpio. 48 constellations were codified by Ptolemy in the 2nd century AD and others were added in modern times. The names and images of the original constellations codified in Mesopotamian Greek tradition have, however, been retained.
Studying the constellation identified by specific culture is very relevant as the lore of the sky forms an important cultural memory. It usually contains a great deal of information about the imaginary world as well as about religion, myth and wisdom. However, identification of ancient constellations has proved to be problematic. For instance, the Egyptians saw a female hippopotamus where we see Draco. Of particular importance among the constellations are those located in the ecliptic, the circle described by the sun in the sky, which can be used to monitor the motion of the sun. This constellation forms a background to the sun as seen from the Earth. Since our star shifts from one constellation to another in the course of the year. Of course, as for any other constellation, they may differ from culture to culture. For us, this set is traditionally made up of 12 constellations, the zodiac. But the Maya had 13 zodiacal constellations, as we really should as well, since also our constellation Ophiuchus crosses the ecliptic. The zodiacal constellations were identified in very ancient times and it is a beautiful thing to use images dating from such far-off antiquity still today. However, the zodiac was developed at the time when no distinction was made between astronomy and astrology. It is worth remembering that astrology is important from the historical point of view but has no scientific basis whatsoever it is a pure fantasy.